Welcome back to Electronic Structure and Bonding in Inorganic Chemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, a lot of what we're going to be doing in inorganic chemistry is not just naming compounds, you know, naming the way ligands interact, whether they're cis or trans to the metal. We're actually going to be looking at the electronic structure. So what does that mean? Well, one thing, let's go ahead and go to the paintbrush very quickly. One thing we hopefully are aware of get the colors, is we have a metal central atom. And situated around it, we have ligands. So these are four of them. And then we have the axial ligands going up and down. OK? So we have a metal with six ligands around it in this fashion. This is what we call octahedral, octahedral geometry. OK, that's going to be our most common type. All right? Now. I'm going to go back over to the PowerPoint and explain something. All right. The ligands, as we hopefully know, the ligand, whatever the molecule is, has a lone pair on it that's going to be the donor lone pair. Okay. In other words, this lone pair is going to interact with the metal. Okay. Then we could have another ligand right here with another donor lone pair that's going to inter interact with the metal this way. Okay. One thing to keep in mind. This lone pair on each of these ligands, what charge does it have? It has a negative charge. Each electron has a minus charge. Electrons are negatively charged, so they're negatively charged. This lone pair is coming from the ligand. However, we also have electrons on the metal. Normally we think of metals having positive charges, but that means they still have electrons. Okay? It's just generally they have fewer electrons than they have protons. Okay? So metals that we're going to be dealing with have five d orbitals. And there's always five d orbitals. An orbital, remember, is a, is, a, is a physical location in space around an atom where you're likely to find electrons. Okay. Another piece of terminology, a node, is where there's zero probability of finding that electron. And it turns out for d orbitals, there's five electrons that we call five d orbitals. And each one has a different three-dimensional geometry. Let's go over these two on the top. And it's, there's a reason we put them together. The first one on the left is the dz squared orbital. Okay, the, this is the one with the donut that goes around this, uh, this lobe that goes in, on the z-axis. Then we have the dzx squared minus y squared. All right. What distinguishes those two on the top from the three on the bottom? Okay. Notice where the x-axis is and the y-axis is in each case. All right? It's only labeled on the first one, but this right here is the x-axis, and then going this way is the y-axis. And in all of these, z-axis is going up and down. I'm mainly concerned with the x-y axes. Notice for these two on the top, the x and y axes go directly through an orbital, or at least the lobes of the orbital. Okay? They go directly through the lobes. All right. Notice how in dx squared y squared, the x-axis is going directly through the orbitals, or it's going right through the areas of electron density, these lobes. The y-axis is going right through these lobes right here, right through areas of electron density. All right. The x and y-axis do the same thing here, except they're penetrating the actual donut part of the dz squared orbital. Okay. If you look at the three on the bottom, Every one of the axes, x, y, and z, they aren't going through the lobes. They're not going through any regions of electron density. You can look at all of them. All of them go only through nodes. Okay. Another way to think about it with d, z, x, for instance, z and x, every one of the lobes is situated in the z, x, or x, z plane. d, y, z, all the lobes are in the y, z plane. Hopefully you can see that, that going like this, this is the yz plane, and then the x completely bisects the node. And then for this dxy, all of the lobes are in the xy plane. The z-axis bisects the node. Okay, That's some ways to think about it. But the fact that there's different geometries of these orbitals actually is going to play a role with their energies once we start putting ligands around the metal. Okay. And one thing to, to, to point out, because it's very important, these orbitals, the d orbitals, these are only on the metal. 
Okay, we only consider the d orbitals on the metal. If I go back here and I want to look at the ligand, the ligand has a lone pair on it. And usually those are either going to be s or p orbitals, okay, generally. The ligand we're not ever really considering d orbitals, okay. So the lone pairs come from the ligand, the d orbitals are from the metal. This is something that's that people get confused at a lot until they really start hitting this pretty hard. Okay, so what we're going to do right now is go over a very conceptual process. This is not actually what happens. It's so we can hopefully see why we get the, the, the crystal field splitting, which is what we're going to be talking about in future videos, why we get that whenever we put the ligands around the metal. If that phrase doesn't make sense, we will get there and explain it as we do. All right, so let's suppose we have the following. Let me go back here. Let's suppose I have a metal with some charge, and it has its d orbitals around it. I'll just indicate it like that. Those are the d orbitals, okay? Put that in red, maybe. So these are the d orbitals. Electron density is just somewhere in there, within that circle or sphere, really. It does not really like that, but let's just suppose that. Now, those five d orbitals from general chemistry, if you remember, we said the d orbitals were all degenerate. They're exactly the same energy. If I have the ligands, an infinite distance away from the metal, completely infinite, or they're basically non-existent, we could think about that. All of those orbitals, the 5d orbitals, have exactly the same energy. And this, this sort of vertical axis right here is increasing energy. All these orbitals indicated by these five lines are the same energy, right? They're all exactly the same energy. They're degenerate, okay? That's because the ligands, which have the lone pairs, are not repelling yet. They're not actually repelling the electrons in the d orbitals. So they're at the lowest energy possible at this point. Okay, but they're all the same energy because there's no interactions right now. Now I'm going to have a situation where what I'm going to do is I'm now going to bring the ligands. I'm going to bring them relatively close. All right. Now I'm only going to draw a you know, four of them for the sake of space. But I'm going to bring the ligands, and notice you wouldn't really draw them this far apart. But I'm bringing them close enough to where I now feel some electrostatic forces, okay? There's some electrostatic forces between that lone pair and the, and the d orbitals. There's enough, there's enough, they're close enough to feel electrostatic forces between this lone pair and the d orbitals, okay? They're feeling some electrostatic forces, but not really that much. They're not really feeling very much but they feel a little bit. Electrons have a negative charge. I don't care if the electrons are in the d orbitals of the metal or the lone pairs of the ligands. They all have a negative charge. And what do we know happens when you put a, two negative charges in vicinity of each other? They can repel, they do repel, number one, and they could accelerate away from each other. We're going to assume they don't accelerate away from each other, but we're bringing the ligands, we're forcing them closer and closer to the metal, so energy increases. Remember this, always. A decrease in energy is a stabilizing effect. An increasing energy is destabilizing. Okay? We're destabilizing it because we're doing what it doesn't want to do. They want to accelerate away from each other, but we're bringing them closer. And that's going to cause all the orbitals to go up in energy. See how these five in stage two, now that we brought the ligands closer? Now the orbitals have all gone up in energy. Okay? But here's the issue. The ligands are not close enough to where we get what's called crystal field splitting. Okay? Splitting is what you observe right here. Notice I have the dz squared, dxy squared. That's gone up in energy from stage two, and these three down here have gone down in energy. That hasn't happened yet. And in fact, at this distance from the metal, it won't happen. But now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to now put them at bonding distance. Now I'm going to have the ligands this close. So the lone pairs of those ligands are now very, very close to the metal's d orbitals. But something interesting is going to happen. Okay, and it happens at about this distance. You might say, well, now, now those, all those orbitals are going to go way up in energy. It turns out that's not what happens. Okay? It turns out that due to some, some considerations that are really quantum mechanics and, and geometry and some weird math and stuff, it turns out that because, there's, because all these orbitals are in different planes and on different axes and stuff, 
there's certain symmetries that, you know, all this stuff, and I'm not going to get into it, but these two orbitals, the quadratic orbitals, dz squared and dx squared minus y squared, they increase in energy. And the three on the bottom that are like dxy, dxz, dyz, they go down in energy from the degenerate state. So state two right here is the degenerate state. And once we put those, those ligands there, now these two quadratics go up and the three others go down. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Stage three, how is it different from stage four? In stage three, what I'm really considering are repulsions. Okay, there's some other things I'm considering, but in other words, I'm not actually considering the attraction between the electrons and the metal. Remember, the metals are going to have positive charges, and you would say a positive charge metal and the negative electrons of the ligands would attract, and they do. This stage three, I'm not considering that attraction yet. I'm only considering the repulsion that's produced, all right? And again, it's some weird stuff that causes these three to go down and these two to go up, you just take my word at this point and run with it, all right? But when I do factor in the attraction between the positively charged metal and the ligands, electrons, it causes everything to drop in energy. So now notice we've dropped, overall the dx squared minus y squared and dz squared have dropped in energy, and these three have also dropped in energy, okay? That's really important. But the main consideration here is those two orbitals, the quadratics, are always higher in energy, and the three on the bottom are going to be lower. We'll find it's flipped for tetrahedral, but for octahedral, this is what we see. This is for octahedral, and I made that distinction in the title of this video. Okay, So once we turn on those electrostatic interaction, interactions, we're complete, and we have this setup. Why is that important? Okay. Because whenever we want to calculate something called the crystal field stabilization energy, we need this setup. Because the orbitals, when we put ligands around them, they're not degenerate. They're not the same energy. All right. The two orbitals that are quadratic, let me go ahead and label them. That's the dz squared and the dx squared minus y squared, the quadratic orbitals. Those two orbitals collectively... And we're not going to get into why this is, but this has to do with some symmetry and group theory. They're designated E sub G. Turns out E sub G is what's referred to as an irreducible representation, but we're not going to go there. The other three orbitals, which happen to be dxy, dxz, and dyz, these three are collectively called T2G. So sometimes when you see E sub G, that just means they're talking about the two quadratics. T2G are the lower energy, the three, the other three d orbitals, okay? Then you'll see this thing that you need to understand what it is. Delta O, or delta octahedral. Most of the time, you just call it delta octahedral, okay? What is delta octahedral? What it literally is, it's the difference in energy between these quadratic orbitals, e.g., and the three orbitals down here, T2G. It's the difference in energy. In other words, it's saying how much... How much higher in energy are the EG from the T2G? What's the difference in energy? All right. Now, what we like to do for the EG and the T2G is we like to compare them to something. But why not compare them to this over here? Why don't we just compare them to the energy from the degenerate state? All right. So why don't we compare them to that energy of the degenerate state? It turns out that if you start from the degenerate state and measure up to the energy of E sub G, the quadratic orbitals, that energy is approximately three-fifths of the overall delta octahedral. So if you knew this total gap in energy, the distance only, or the difference in energy only between that of the, um, of the degenerate state to the E sub G, that's three-fifths of the distance, three-fifths of that total energy, delta octahedral. If you instead measure the difference in energy between the degenerate state and the lower energy T2G, it's about two-fifths of delta octahedral. Now, it would be amazing if it was exactly three-fifths or two-fifths. It's an approximation, but for, this, for these purposes, that works. Okay? And this right here is called, this setup is the octahedral crystal field. Okay? The octahedral crystal field. What is an octahedral crystal field? It's an electric field. Okay, it's an electric field, all right? Electric field, the same kind of thing that you, 
that you talked about in physics. Okay, it results from the forces of attraction and the forces of electro uh, forces of repulsion. Excuse me, between charged particles. Okay, but for octahedral complexes, this setup that you see right here, it just turns out that that's what happens when you have octahedral uh, molecules or compounds, I should say, you want to calculate crystal field stabilization energy, okay? So this setup is something that you need to remember, okay? It always helps um, if, you, if you can re remember to draw this, to draw the degenerate state and then draw the octahedral crystal field and have the three-fifths delta octahedral and the two-fifths delta octahedral, okay? Notice one thing, if you add three-fifths and two-fifths, you get five-fifths or one. So if you had three fifths delta octahedral plus two fifths delta octahedral, you get just get delta octahedral. So it makes sense that those two add to be the total energy because one of them's just going up in energy from the degenerate state, the other's just going down. So the sum of them have to equal the total delta octahedral. Okay. But one thing to certainly remember is that dz squared and dx squared minus y squared, or e sub g, up here at the top, higher in energy. And dxy, dxz, dyz, the three, are the T2g that have dropped down in energy from the degenerate state. Okay, So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. It'll make more sense once we start doing problems. And that's where we're actually going to physically calculate a quantity referred to as crystal field stabilization energy, which we abbreviate as CFSE. Okay? And we're going to go into more detail on what this quantity is and what it means in... Uh, the next few videos, okay? In the next video, what we're going to talk about is something, are two things that are referred to as high spin and low spin, and how they re relate to something called high field and low field, sometimes strong field and weak field, okay? We're going to talk about that. And we're also going to hopefully get some intuition on why those things happen like that, okay? And we'll cover that in the next video. So make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Like I said, we're going to do a lot more with crystal field stabilization energy in the next few videos. And we're going to do some examples of them and hopefully get a grasp of that. See you in the next video.